and I want to welcome everybody who's watching to Book Talks, the place where two sisters writing and publishing shares our amazing authors who offer information, insights, and inspiration that can help you open a new chapter in your life to live bigger, better, and bolder. And one of the major themes that we talk about with our authors are, is diversity and inclusion. And Hilda Pinnix Ragland is our guest today. She is an absolute trailblazing powerhouse, woman executive, board of directors member, woman who is carving paths for other women and women of color to sit on corporate boards and to participate in the conversations where she can talk about $4 million endowments and more. She's really making a difference and she wrote about it in her, the en energy within us. She and four other amazing executive women who have shattered the black and glass ceiling in corporate America, specifically in the energy industry. So I want to welcome you, Hilda Penix Ragland. So honored and privileged to talk with you today. Thank you, Elizabeth. I really appreciate those who have a chance to participate and to uh, link in and watch. Mm -hmm. And to you and your sister, Catherine and Elizabeth, <laughs> and uh, we actually have really enjoyed working with you over you. a few years now. And so yes, this, yes. The book has continued to thrive and do well, and of course, all of the proceeds go directly to fund young women going into the energy sector, and we do that through the American Association of Blacks in Energy. So, uh, any of you listening? Thanks for purchasing a book. If you haven't done so, please do so. Thank you. You're welcome. So let's just dive right in. Do you have the book with you, Hilda? Of course. I keep the book at my <laughs> side at all times. Here's the book. <laughs> okay. And it's uh, The Energy Within Us. Um, mm -hmm. It's our trailblazers. All of us, as mm -hmm. you know, Elizabeth, actually were the first African-American women in the C-suite at our company. Mm -hmm. So um, I had some phenomenal sisters with Joyce Hayes Giles and Talisa Tolliver and Carolyn Green and Rose McKinney James, um, just dear, I would say the kitchen cabinet, but they're the friends, they're my energy colleagues. Beautiful. Well, I wanna talk about the book, its content and its intention today. So let's start off by uh, what the book is about. To please talk about how you all came together and decided to embark on this project. It's quite unique because it's a compilation of each of your stories and how you did rise to the top. Well, as I was actually retiring uh, from the, uh, my company, Duke Energy, after 35 plus years, um, as I looked around the room, we were at the... Um, American Association of Blacks and Energy Conference, our annual conference. And I, I thought to myself, you should never leave a road without others along the way, meaning a pipeline of others. And then since many of us had experienced, or some of us, I won't say many, had experienced, um, I would say, um, different kinds of navigation methods um, we each came from different perspectives in the energy sector. And uh, I wanted to make sure we shared some nuggets of, of wisdom, some points that we learned along the path. Uh, because as you know, Elizabeth, my section was, was entitled, The Road Less Traveled. Yes. Um, because I did not have an African-American female to actually watch as she, I'll say matriculated or actually navigated and was promoted through the ranks. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure we left the path for others. And we were at the conference, I uh, wrote a little note to uh, Carolyn and said, I want to, uh, I think we need to write this book. And uh, she said, Okay, um, and kept knowing Carolyn, she started just jotting down some things. Uh, Joyce was to my left, I did the same to her. And um, then Rose, and then uh, Talisa. 
And I invited them all to come in my room. Um, I did have a, a few treats for them. <laughs> and they said, but what are we, how are we going to start? I've never written a book. Now, Joyce, to her credit, said, she said, well, I've always thought about it. My, you know, people have asked me about it, um, but I haven't done it. And so, um, thank goodness, they all said yes. And we discussed um, in the room. And um, we said, how would we start? And I just said, let's start from the time you first touched energy. And I gave them the example of mine. They said, how do we do that? I said, well, I was pumping gas. I and love that uncle's, story. Um, gas station. <laughs> and then yes. I did underground gas tank testing. And then when I went on to do the MBA program, I did that same thing. We actually wrote a thesis in underground gas tank testing. And that was a time they were extracting, um, or excavating all of the gas tanks around the country mm. uh, because of leakage. And so it's a great example of things that you learn along the way mm -hmm. can actually come back and, and help you. Mm -hmm. um, and then later, um, after a stint in New York with Colgate and with Arthur Anderson um, in the public accounting arena, I um, came back here, we recruited back here and I was in the energy sector and spent over 35 years and had an incredible career. Highly recommended. I was never bored. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't long, and then I was moved to another uh, opportunity. So uh, it was really advancing and, and elaborating your portfolio, never staying in a place too long mm -hmm. to become complacent but mm -hmm. doing your homework and learning and being prepared mm -hmm. as you went along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about your story, Hilda, because it's really, really remarkable. You grew up in an era where, as you said, there were no women or women of color executives. There were no women or women of color in leadership positions. And yet you had a very feisty spirit you wanted to pump gas, you wanted to work on the farm, you wanted to learn, you wanted to make money, you wanted to learn, do everything that a boy would be doing at that time, right? And then you were fortunate to earn a scholarship and you actually were working in Manhattan. Can you take us back to that era and how unique it was for you to be advancing into certain positions that you had? Oh, wow, thanks so much, Elizabeth. You know, when I look back over my career, I um, um, actually am one of four girls. I'm the second of four girls. My father, my grandmother, my grandfathers, my, my aunts, my aunts and uncles all said, you can. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that we could. So they gave us a deep sense of confidence. And so I must say that was a part of me. Um, I did go on to North Carolina A&T. And then what was really neat when I was there as a sophomore at North Carolina A&T, I was always inquisitive. I did like to make money now. Mm -hmm. um, it was nice because I thought, wow, I can do this, I can do that. Um, and it always hit me a nest egg somewhere. I like my own money. I don't want someone just to hand me something. And I earned it, which made me so proud. But I interned. I actually went over in the Career Center. They had interns. I saw posted. I went over and I um, interviewed. And they said, well, you're a sophomore. This is usually for juniors uh, or seniors, uh, but not for sophomores. And I said, but why not? And I interviewed, and believe it or not, I got the job, and I went to, to New York for the interview. I did have relatives in Connecticut, and so I called my aunt and my uncle and actually stayed with them, took the train every day. Uh, four o'clock in the morning, I'd get up, I'd ride the train from um, East Norwalk Station, uh, and I ride it into Grand Central and walk down to 300 Park Avenue. And so I was a Colgate scholar. I loved it. I loved New York. 
Uh, and I said, I'm going back to New York and stay. I can't say my mom and dad really liked that, but my dad would always say, I can't stop you. You're too much like my mother. And I went there. And of course I knew my mother had cousins there in New York. And so uh, um, for some reason, I guess someone was always around me. And then I had a dear friend in school and um, she did the same. And so we, of course we both went off to um, New York and actually it was three of us when we graduated. But then when I was intern, I'd intern in the summer and then I had the audacity to ask them, do they have winter interns between schools? Ooh. I didn't co-op, it was between schools. So essentially when you got out for your fall break, uh, I would go and intern. And I knew I had a place to stay uh, in Connecticut. So, and I knew the, you know, how to get to the office and all, and they did it and they paid me which was great. I also took the opportunity, I asked if I could participate in their stock uh, purchase plan, and they allowed me as an intern. So I could actually gain money, and I laugh about it because I was able to buy my youngest sister a car when wow. she was at Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, yeah, she was undergraduate, I think, at that time, or she may have been in dental school then. But I was always asking questions. And then in New York, Arthur Anderson. Um, Arthur Anderson, I would say, was, uh, that was unbelievable as well. Because um, I had some of the best audits. I went to St. Charles and developed friends there. I have a, um, I didn't know it at the time, but perhaps a unique way of connecting uh, to people, and I call that today strategic sustainable relationships. Mm. And when you make relationships, as I did with you and uh, Catherine, uh, you're friends of mine. Yes, you're, we're colleagues and we work together, but you're friends. And so I developed those strategic sustainable relationships and we will always connect. I don't just drop someone. Um, I will be there and I want your, you to be successful as well. And that's just a, something I believe. Mm -hmm. So at Arthur Anderson, um, I went on audits. I was still asking questions and um, there I linked in and had some of the, and then that, I will say this is a sense of d and I in today's sense. I was intrigued by the varying, um, the different Jewish uh, religions. I knew about Judaism, but the different ones. And I had the opportunity to work with um, several. And I would ask them on our trips back and forth from whether it was California together. And, and I had consumer products. I had some awesome audits like mm -hmm. Estee Lauder and Standard Brands, which is uh, Planters and all of that, Dom uh, Domino's, D uh, Domini yeah, Domino's Sugar. Mm -hmm. um, but I had some awesome, awesome. I had Wall Street audits. It was unbelievable. And so I engaged with them. The people that I developed as friends then are friends today. Wow. And so Amazing. that's strategic, sustainable relationships. Hilda, what is the formula for anybody who's watching and wants to learn how to do that? What do you do? Never discount anyone that you come in contact with. Treat everyone with respect. Don't just title up and look down, but rather work collectively and looking at the person. Mm -hmm. The person who you may doubt, who may not have something today, could be that person that will actually reach back and pull you up. So don't worry about how far I'm gonna go or anything like that. Focus on what you can do to support others. You actually learn by supporting others. I know that's hard for people to understand. There's also a saying, it's one of my, actually my mentees, uh, Bill Johnson, he said, it's, not about you, but it's all about you. Mm -hmm. 
And I think when you st start digging into that, you understand it even more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't discount people. Mm -hmm. The other thing is when I look at some of the boards I'm on today, one started with a lunch. One of my neighbors said, Hilda, you're an energy. I want you to meet a friend of mine. And uh, this guy is, in, is international. We had a three-hour lunch. I was so intrigued. And so next thing I knew, he was saying, Hilda, would you like to be on our board? And I said, well, I never thought about it. I was there to try to see how I can help you uh, and help your company advance. And then I later asked him, I said, why do you want me? Uh, what value do you see that I bring? And he said, you never stop. You're inquisitive. Mm -hmm. And you don't just leave it at a, at a low level or uh, question. You want to dig deeper for understanding. Mm -hmm. And so I would always say, ask questions. Engage. Mm -hmm. And I think that really helps you learn. And it actually challenges your brain. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is, what you learn in undergraduate and graduate school that's really propels you to continue in the workplace. When I learned uh, computers and worked on that in school, it was um, COBOL and Fortran. I don't think they use that language today. Mm -hmm. So you really need to let your mind continue to learn. Mm -hmm. It's lifelong learning. And if you listen, you can learn from people, mm -hmm. no matter so what age. I love that. I love everything you're saying is so informative and inspiring. Can you please explain corporate boards? We know it's important for women and people of color to be on corporate boards, but can you just please explain what is a corporate board? What does it do? And once you get there, what's your responsibility? What a great question. <laughs> um, Thank you. And I'll be honest, that's not something that I learned about at, uh, at A&T or in high school. Um, I did at Duke. Um, but, you know, you, maybe they talked about it, but we didn't really get into it. I was an accounting undergraduate, so I was focused on the numbers and, and that curriculum um, and making sure that the, the numbers and auditing was done correctly and everything. So corporate boards, when you think of the CEO, most of us think of the CEO, and I'll give you um, the CEO of a Southwest Water Company. Um, and so you don't think of, of who hires that CEO. Uh, you focus on getting an education, getting a job, uh, upward mobility or sometimes going lateral to go up or going out to go up and your boss but you don't and then you have this chart and they call that the organization chart and then you say oh those are the people at the top some people call those executive leadership teams and all of that they report to the ceo and understand just like a pyramid in my book i said there's a pyramid and, you know, when you come in at the lower level, it, you know, you start moving. It's a fewer and fewer people as you go to the top. Well, on top of that CEO is a board of directors, a corporate board of directors. They will hire the CEO. But most people don't think. They will also, they have uh, their hands off. They are looking at it from a strategic perspective. And so you're looking at, has the CEO hired the right leaders? Has he or she developed the leaders? What kind of culture do they have? Do they have an, a, strong, a strong financial group? Um, do, does the CFO have the credentials and can he or she execute in accordance with shareholders, um, in accordance with SEC guidelines? Um, can 
can they make sure you don't have fraud and other things that are going awry? Do they have a strong external and internal um, auditing group? Um, within the financial, you have that M&A. The, the, the board often will look at the mergers and acquisitions and making sure those companies continue to grow if mm. that is where we want to go. Mm -hmm. Now, so they have, the board cannot put their hands in. And when I say that, it's eyes on, but hands out. So you see, <laughs> you're not there to run the company. You're there to review and evaluate is strategic. You do have fiduciary responsibilities. You do need to make sure you have no conflicts of interest because you can go to jail. There are liabilities on the board. Yes, most people look at it as the payment, but for me, when I'm looking at a corporate board or evaluating that corporate board, I'm checking to see, is that something that aligns with my core competencies? Can mm -hmm. I add value? Is it a board I want to sit around? Because it's a team. It's not an individual. It's a team making decisions. So is it a board that I can really do? I trust that the people that I'm sitting around the table with. Mm -hmm. And in um, many environments, recent environments, many companies have gone astray and they haven't really focused on what their board fiduciary responsibilities are. And so you really have to ask probing, intriguing questions um, and listen. And if you see trends, you need to ask. If you have cyber issues, you need to be on top of that. I mentioned this morning, I met with the, and this was without management, met with Deloitte. Mm -hmm. I also meet with PwC on another board. I chair another audit committee. So you really need to make sure the board you go on is not for money. It is for value added. Yes, there's an, a treat, but at the same time, you can't just look at that. And by the way, if you're getting paid, you need to pay taxes on that as well. Um, I chair the governance and nominating committee for board. And with that, you want to make sure you get the right skill sets. Uh, we were looking for someone with international scientific research uh, and that background. We also wanted a person that's diverse. You need to make sure. Um, and it takes time to go through it. You need a strong governance process. Mm -hmm. So Hilda, why is it so important for women and people of color to be on corporate boards? You know, diversity, difference of thought, women above anyone, we bring to the table a totally different lens. And boards that have, that are diverse, especially in this environment with, with women and I'll say with African Americans and people of color, they have gone, grown up from in, in a very different setting in many places, in a different lens, they have a different lens than most of the people sitting around that table. Now, when you're sitting on a board, you need to engage. You don't just sit there and check a box. You need to ask questions about the DNI program, diversity and inclusion program. Mm -hmm. And you don't like what you see, you need to ask why. Why, why. why are these trends the way they are? And I'm I'm so happy to say this has been a conversation of every board um, I currently serve on. And I am so pleased with where we're going. Um, listening is important. Um, with, with all of this as we go forward. But the other piece I want to address, the profits of companies who have diverse boards. That's just not diversity of race, diversity of ethnic backgrounds, diversity of age. Mm -hmm. When they have it, they are more 
profitable. Mm. Why does this matter? Adherence to shareholder guidance. Because, you know, shareholders are buying this stock of some of the publicly held companies. Or if you're a private company, someone's investing. I mean, no matter who it is, you want to make sure you continue that return on investment, but not at the expense of employees. So that's another piece. Always look at the employees of a company. And I always say it starts with the employees, its performance, and its excellence in all areas. Mm -hmm. So how does a person position him or herself to be plucked to have the privilege of serving on a board? Do you apply? Do you, what do you do? Okay. Um, it's very different from a normal interview. Very different. Teams, or can you sit with the team? All of them are high performers. Uh, many are CEOs or C-suite uh, execs. And, um, and so it's, it's looking at your, number one, your skill set. When you're going through your um, career, there are some things. I would say always diversify your portfolio of skill set. Take on the tough task. Um, if you have the opportunity for a P&L function, take it. Take it. If there is a tough task, take it. Because you're going to learn from each one of those. And why am I saying that? If you have international background, that's good. And in today's environment, cyber, cyber, um, artificial intelligence, any of this technology will make a profound impact as you move into a potential board seat. So on boards, there are, I would say, three to four core um, committees. Mm -hmm. You have audit. And that requires financial expertise. And there are some things you'll need for financial expertise. You have um, a finance committee that, you know, looking at M&As and everything, uh, mergers and acquisitions and the like. Mm -hmm. You have compensation. Often these people are coming in from a uh, HR background. Um, or you've had a lot of compensation HR expertise. That's human resources. I keep using acronyms. Yeah. And then you, you may have uh, governance and nominating. Mm -hmm. uh, that governance and nominating, they're, they're, they are positioned to look at the total governance of an organization, making sure things are run in accordance with NACD guidelines. NACD is National Association of Corporate Directors. Uh, private directors are, would be another piece there. And then I'll go into some of those where you can get, you can Google and actually find out more information. So I would say those are the four core ones. Today I'll bring in technology. And mm -hmm. audit is usually audit and risk, or they will separate them. Mm -hmm. In many companies today, you have environmental, social responsibility, and um, ESG governance. Mm -hmm. um, and almost every company is you ask for your ESG scorecard and making sure you are environmentally sound and you do uh, or linked to your to social responsibility and you have corporate governance are you working with the communities and the people that you serve mm -hmm. so i would say those are the four or five core committees so as you're going through your career make sure you have some time to to spend in those or mm -hmm. if you are not in that area now you don't ask mm -hmm. for a rotation or for an opportunity in that area, um, you can do that. Mm -hmm. How do you get on those boards? Okay. I mentioned NACD, National Association of Corporate Directors. They mm -hmm. have a recruiting um, arm. Mm -hmm. um, ELC, Executive Leadership Council, Black execs around the, the, the world. And we are there, and I'm on that committee. We're there. Uh, companies will come into us, ask us, for board members ready, board members who are ready to serve. And we'll try to pair based on 
what they're looking for. So they may be looking for, I had one recently needed someone in music background. Um, they needed someone on the East Coast, or they may need someone on the West Coast. You're looking for certain things, and so you're trying to pair them. And the other thing is you're making sure that person that you recommended, or the four or five that you recommended, um, can actually serve on the board. You have to get permission mm -hmm. to serve on the board from your general counsel at your particular company. Mm -hmm. So it's being ready. Mm -hmm. uh, another place you can get them would be private directors. And one that most people hear about is with the, um, uh, I'll call them the recruiting research, I mean, the uh, search firms. And so okay. they may be Hydric, they may be um, Corn Ferry, they may be um, many of the, the companies are out there. Mm -hmm. and, so they, and then you have a few others that are out there recruiting um, as of recently, though, um, NASDAQ and a couple of the others have started because when they did the surveys, they found out that very few people of color, specifically African-Americans, were on uh, boards of directors mm. and very few women either. So. Mm -hmm. so, Hilda, this is a lot of information. It's complex. There's acronyms. There's committees. There's things I've never heard before. You are a mentor to women in corporate positions. And so can you please speak to the importance of having a mentor who can, along the way, explain and guide all of the things you just mentioned to me that, if you try to learn it all at once, might seem a little overwhelming. <laughs> and it, it's a, it really is. And you... Um, I have, I mentioned the mentors in my book. Mm -hmm. I mentioned mentees. Um, and I mentioned even on this um, discussion, um, Bill Johnson and Bob McGee and um, some of the mentors I had along the path. Um, uh, I did not have the opportunity to have a female mentor. Um, we just didn't have them. And so we had males and I was very fortunate that males recognize uh, my potential and would um, allow me some of the very um, unique opportunities. So I am very thankful of that. But I vowed to myself when I was at, um, at the, going through the Duke Energy, uh, CPNL, Progress Energy, Duke Energy, that I would never leave the, a room, a department, a board uh, the way I found it. Mm -hmm. And I have really been on a mission mm -hmm. to, and I, right now I co-chair a pay equity commission for women in the greater triangle community. And I just, I believe mm -hmm. that if you work and you earn and you perform at the mm -hmm. same level as a male, that you too should get paid at the same level. Yes. I do not believe that sex or stature or whatever has anything to do with the brain and, and its ability to execute uh, successfully. And so, so I'm not true. asking for handouts. We're just saying pay us for what we are worth. And so yes. the mentors, I said I would never leave it. And as I was trying to conclude the book, a critical part of who I am and how I have learned and developed and continue to do so today mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. through my mentors, yes. uh, my mentees. Mm -hmm. And so my mentees, I'm, I'm not easy um, as a mentor. Um, <laughs> and I do ask and I must see delivery of them. And some of them wrote about it. Mm -hmm. um, but they know I, and I bowed to them then and several have gone on to their vice presidents and all. I said, I will never leave you. You may tire of me, but I won't leave you. And so even though I am retired uh, or rewired from Duke, I am still working with the mentees. Mm. Uh, I'm so proud of them. I'm just so proud of them. I cannot say it enough. And they're not just an energy. I have them from all over. Mm -hmm. um, I do focus heavily on women and people of color.
Mm-hmm. They're very fortunate to have you because I know you do not <laughs> allow for any slacking, and they testify well, I don't to that. Believe in mediocrity. <laughs> no, 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 it's awesome. You believe in absolute excellence. So today, I started the morning quite early at five thirty, and continue with a couple of meetings. I have a energy consultant project that I'm working with. Um, to reorganize and help them develop a strategic plan and their budget and all of that. And then after that, I went right into one of my uh, audit, pre-audit committee meetings with the external auditor. I chair the, uh, actually I chair the audit committee for RTI International, one of the boards that I sit on. And then I continued right on and went over to Cree Corporation a uh, huge international corporation here in Research Triangle Park. And today we had a huge announcement, a partnership between North Carolina a and State University and Cree, whereby students would start in their freshman year and actually have four years of an endowed scholarship to Cree, they would also have the opportunity to intern and they perhaps even full-time employment. And just today, a t was named as the uh, Money Magazine's uh, top 100 uh, companies, um, not companies, but organizations, universities. Mm-hmm. And just a couple, not long ago in Time Magazine, our chancellor was featured, so we're really getting a lot of momentum. I currently serve as vice chair of the North Carolina a and State University Board and chair of the Endowment and Investment Committee. Uh, so it is a big day. It was a wonderful, wonderful investment and partnership of $4 million. Dollars. Wow. So it's an awesome day. And <laughs> I'm so proud of Chancellor Harold Martin and the Aggie team and the incredible partners in Cree Corporation. So mm. uh, uh, unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. Oh, that is an excellent example of putting money where the need is. That's amazing. Yes. Congratulations, Hilda. And, and of course, this is in doubt. So this will go on when we are no longer actually here on earth. And so those will continue to multiply. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, as always, we want more. But today is a highlight and Cree Corporation deserves the credit. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Congratulations. That is amazing. Well, thank you for making that announcement here on Book Talks. And I'm so very, very proud to know you and that Two Sisters Writing and Publishing published your book. Can you hold it up again once more, one more time, please? Of course, Hilda? of course, of course. Okay, okay. You can get your copy of The Energy Within Us uh, at Amazon.com. And it's uplifting. All of their stories are fun, poignant, inspiring, motivating, informative, and Hilda's story is just spectacular. I just loved reading about when you were a little girl. Just was really, you know, your attitude was just, I'm going to do this. And here you are. You did it. It's amazing. Well, I'm still working. I'm still mm-hmm. working at getting better and better every day. We all learn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every yeah. day. Well, I want to thank you, Hilda Penix Ragland, for joining us here today on Book Talks, where the authors of Two Sisters Writing and Publishing share insights and information and inspiration that can inspire you to open new chapters in your life and live bigger, better, and bolder. Thank you, Hilda, and we will see all of you on the next episode of Book Talks. Thank you. You're welcome. (laughs) Love talking with you.